All right, hello. Uh, my name is Dan Lustig. I'm the chair of the Memory Model Task Group. Um, so if you, or for those of you who were around at the last workshop in Shanghai, uh, you might recall that we had just formed this task group uh, just a little bit before the uh, workshop had started. And so for the past six months or so, we've been actively working on this, um, myself with uh, Arvind, the vice chair in the back, and a few dozen of the other of, uh, top experts in the world. We brought them all into this group. Uh, we've been working on this, and uh, what I want to do with this talk is just give an overview of what we came up with in that time. Uh, Krista gave uh, one slide summary. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more detail. Um, for, for an audience this size, I'm not going to go into all of the details, although I'm happy to talk about all of the subtleties, all the corner cases, all the formalisms offline. Uh, come find me anytime afterwards. OK. So first off, let me remind everyone what our goal was and what our charter was in the task group. Um, so first of all, or obviously, we wanted to define what the memory consistency model is. Uh, so People think of this in a lot of different ways. Uh, what it really means at the end of the day is a specification of what values are legal to be returned by loads in the program. That involves lots of questions about whether instructions can be reordered and what fences mean and so on and so on. But at the end of the day, this is what a memory model is meant to define. Uh, there are separate formalism. There's a separate formalism task group that's uh, uh, chartered with defining everything else, uh, formalizing everything else about what the ISA does. Um, we're focusing on this one particular question, which obviously uh, has a lot of detail, a lot of subtleties that goes into it. Um, some of the things that we wanted to do as part of this process, some of the things that we wanted to keep in mind uh, are listed here. So first of all, uh, as Krista said, we wanted RISC-V to target a lot of different implementations, uh, some tiny microcontrollers, maybe big uh, Unix servers. Uh, we at NVIDIA are doing, uh, as we said, some uh, we're embedding some of these RISC-V cores into our GPUs. Some people want formally verified cores. There's any number of different use cases. We wanted to have the memory model uh, be available to all of these different uh, use cases um, to make sure that uh, the memory model doesn't get in the way. We want to support all of these things. And likewise for software. Uh, there's any number of important software packages that uh, we really want to make sure are properly supported. So I listed just a couple here, Linux, C, C++, Java. And these are just some of the ones that have been more formally analyzed in the memory model literature, um, but it's by no means an exhaustive list. We want the memory model to be able to support all of these uh, software packages. Anything you might want to run on any other architecture, it should be able to run on RISC-V as well. And so that, to some extent, ruled out some of the more maybe researchy or more academic uh, memory models, some of the crazier things that people have proposed that haven't actually been proven to support some of this, uh, haven't been proven to support software packages like this. Uh, we really wanted to focus on things that were actually practical so that we could uh, meet all of these bullets. So uh, this has been something that obviously has been going on for decades in the research community to figure out what all the different types of memory models can be. Uh, there's been uh, no shortage of different ideas that have been thrown out there. I'm going to give just a high-level summary uh, just to give some background in case you're not entirely familiar with it. And I'm just going to put it on this one spectrum here from uh, strong on this side to weak on the other side. So if you have strong memory models, the idea is you put a little bit more, uh, more restrictions on types of architectures that you can build from a hardware perspective. But as a result, you get a much easier uh, programming model uh, for programmers to use so that it's much easier to actually uh, use these cores in a multi-core setting. On the other extreme, you have weak memory models, which relax some of these restrictions that you put on the hardware and therefore allow you to build more optimizations that you can expose to the programmer. It gives you uh, arguably better performance and power and area uh, characteristics, or just gives you more flexibility in general uh, to do more types of reordering and buffering and coalescing and whatnot uh, in your architecture. Uh, but the cost of that is that you get oftentimes a much, much more complicated programming model to the point where you can stare at it for days, weeks, months, and still not have any idea what's going on. And so there's no right answer here. There's a spectrum uh, depending on what exactly you're looking for. In your particular use case, you might prefer strong models. You might prefer weak models. You might think the other side is completely crazy and out of their minds, all of the above. Um, and so this is kind of where we were. We've been working on this for the past six months or so, like I said. But um, there's no, it's not going to settle the debate. There's no single right answer. Um, also, the point here at the bottom is important that uh, I said C and Java and Linux and all these things are important use cases that we wanted to support. Um, they're both going to work either way. Or all of these software packages are going to work either way. That's been proven in practice on all the other architectures that are out there. 
And so that wasn't in and of itself a deciding factor. Um, really, we just wanted to figure out where along the spectrum we wanted to be. So as we started, uh, we said we threw out a number of different ideas. And then to make a long story short, uh, we started to narrow it down to these two options, which Krista has already described. We had uh, RVTSO, as we call it. It's just uh, total store ordering that you're familiar with from Spark or x86, just specialized for RISC-V, so we call it RVTSO. And then we have this other memory model that we're uh, using here called uh, RISC-V weak memory ordering, RVWMO. And that's roughly similar to RMV8 um, if you're familiar with that model and want to have some intuition for what it looks like. And I'll talk about it a little bit more in the coming slides. And in particular, uh, one of the high level or one of the important points here is that both of these models are uh, what we call multi copy atomic, or sometimes called other multi copy atomic in the ARM literature. And what that means um, at a high level is that you're allowed, uh, cores are allowed to peek at stores that they have issued as long as those stores haven't been observed by anybody else. You can peek at your own stores early. You can't peek at anybody else's stores until they become globally visible. I'll explain this with a picture in just a second. But the takeaway before I get into that, the, important, the reason I bring this up is because that alone, that's the one thing that keeps this memory model from getting enormously complex. That decision in and of itself really keeps this model uh, manageable compared to some of the more extreme cases out there. So it's an important point to highlight. OK, so as uh, Krista had said um, in his introduction slides, uh, what we decided to do, we, we went back and forth. We were debating, should it be TSO, should it be WMO, back and forth, back and forth. And what we decided to do is that if neither side is really willing to give up what they're looking for, give up their use case, which makes sense, then really what we need to do, the best option would be to support both of these at the same time. And so what we want to do is have RVWMO, this weak ARM-like memory model, uh, we want to have that as the base memory model. So um, that's compatible with most of the hardware, hopefully all of the hardware that's out there. If not, come talk to me afterwards, and we can chat about it. But that's meant to be compatible with the hardware and the software that's been out there for a while now. It doesn't prevent you from, being, uh, from building hardware that's more conservative. So you can still build a TSO core, um, and that's completely compatible uh, with w um, RV WMO. Um, that's fine. But software, uh, if it's going to be compatible with this, has to match this uh, RV WMO spec, which I'll describe on the next slide. Um, but at the same time, because the TSO use cases are out there, um, whether you want formal verification or you have legacy x86 code that you want to port over to RISC-V or any number of other use cases, we're going to have this uh, RVTSO also supported by uh, this new extension, which we're calling, for the moment at least, ZTSO. It's going to be one of these optional extensions, which basically exposes to software the fact that the hardware in question is actually uh, TSO. It's a stricter subset of uh, the types of behaviors that an RVWMO core might otherwise provide. Um, so you might, for example, have a core that supports, uh, or the ISA choices that it has is IMAFD plus ZTSO, or maybe GC plus ZTSO, or any other combination, right? OK. So what do these memory models look like? So let me draw this picture. This is obviously a very cartoonish picture here. So it, there's. Uh, most microarchitectures are not going to look like this, but if you're a microarchitect, hopefully you can take the cartoon I'm drawing here and map it onto the specifics of whatever microarchitecture you have in mind. But for this cartoon picture, um, the intuition, or which I want to use to build up the intuition here for both of the models, RVWMO and RVTSO, I want to show it like this. There's pipelines up here at the top. Um, there's some heart private buffering in the middle here. So those values, you know, the stores that are sitting in there are visible only to the heart that issued them. And then at the bottom is uh, global memory or atomic memory, whatever you want to call it. It basically is a block of memory which makes, thing, which makes the data in it visible to all cores, either through physical buffering or because the cache coherence protocol is single writer, multiple reader, and does it in that kind of way. Whatever you choose to do for your microarchitecture, just conceptually, there's this atomic memory block in the middle here. And so the key part of this notion of multi-copy atomicity that I mentioned was that there's nothing in between these two. There's no uh, sense, there's no way in which a heart can peek at someone else's heart private buffering. There's no caches or any other type of buffering that's shared between some of the cores, but not other cores that doesn't uh, interact with this cache coherence protocol in this particular way. 
Um, it really has to be one or the other. That's what keeps the memory model uh, accessible. As soon as every core can start seeing things in a different order, completely independent of all the other core's observations, that's when the me memory models get really complicated and really, really difficult to track. So we just decided, let's not do that. Um, let's keep it in this multi-copy atomic fashion. So the difference between RVWMO and RVTSO, conceptually at least, is what happens at the point where stores um, and loads become globally visible, which um, there's a notion of performing that you may have seen if you're familiar with some of the memory model literature. It's not often used um, so much anymore in terms of the formal uh, research that's come out in the past few years, um, but it's still good for building up intuition. So if you want to think of how uh, this works, say operationally, uh, let's talk about loads and stores separately. So a store would go through the pipeline, it would sit in the heart private buffering for some amount of time, and then at some point it would drain into the atomic memory. Uh, if you have loads, you would have them first check their heart private buffering to see if there's anything they should forward from, and if they don't find anything, then they read from the most recent store to that address of what's in the global memory there. And so the difference between these two memory models is basically, like I said, what happens at this point of global visibility. They differ in the amount of reordering that each heart can expose to this uh, global notion of ordering. If you have TSO, uh, load to load, load to store, and store to store ordering are always going to be enforced no matter what, but you can have store to load ordering, uh, reordering, sorry. That's probably familiar to anyone who's looked at uh, TSO or any memory models in the past. That's one of the more common uh, use cases. With RVWMO, it's much more uh, permissive than that. Until you have any type of synchronization, whether it's a fence or an acquire or release annotation, um, if you have none of that, then you can reorder things arbitrarily, uh, pretty much. There's obviously subtleties there. I'm going to gloss over it a little bit for a talk to 500 people. Um, but the idea is that let people, uh, let the architecture reorder things as much as it chooses to do so for the sake of optimizations and then only reorder things when you act, or only keep things in order when you actually have software telling you that it's necessary. Okay, so in a little bit more detail about what the actual reorderings um, that are, or the reorderings that are forbidden by RVWMO, what types of synchronization can you have? Um, this is where we filled in some of the details that weren't uh, in some of the original uh, documentation. This is what we've been uh, working on. Uh, so some of this, uh, if you're familiar with the, memory, the way memory models work, this shouldn't be too surprising to you. Uh, so we have some same address orderings that you, you, would, be, you would expect to be enforced. Uh, if you have a fence in there, that keeps things in order, obviously. If you have acquires and releases, that keeps things uh, in order in one direction or the other, as shown here on the slide. Um, there's uh, .aqrl. If we use that annotation, we've decided to make that um, RCSC as opposed to RCPC, for those of you who know what that means, basically it's uh, sequentially consistent synchronization operations as opposed to processor consistent operations. I'm happy to follow up offline, like I said, if any of this is unclear, if you just want to follow up for uh, more explanation. Um, we clarified a lot about how atomics work um, and load reserve store conditional as well. And in particular, this one here on the right is one of the uh, big new additions. This was something, uh, so syntactic address control and data dependencies. This is something that um, has, people have gone back and forth, but now it's pretty much accepted as a good thing for architectures to have in their memory model. It's important for having, uh, making sure that Linux works. It's, uh, it's been back and forth in C and C++ for a while, but it's looking like it's going to emerge again. So this is one of the important things that we did add to the memory model. Uh, to make sure that we're compatible with the best practices in the field at this point. Um, so there's rules at the bottom. Uh, like I said, uh, we have rules for what loads return, what values loads return based on the orderings that have been taking place. Um, we clarified what the rules are for atomicity. There's subtleties there as well. Um, and available offline, we have the full, fully laid out uh, specification in uh, three different ways at least, plus the informal natural language version. So there's any number of ways. There's lots of different preferences that people have for how to analyze these and make the most sense of them. It's all available offline. We'll probably post it to ISA Dev at some point, uh, maybe this week or shortly thereafter, once people have had a chance to look at it. Um, and then we'll get that out there. If you want to look at what TSO would be, uh, RVTSO, or if hardware implements the ZTSO extension, um, it gets a little bit simpler, right? It's what you would expect. It's load to load, load to store, store to store ordering. Um, that you're familiar with, or if you have a fence in there, or nothing can be reordered past an atomic. That's it. 
those are the rules. I mean, it keeps it simple. It's much easier to think about. But again, it restricts some of the types of optimizations that uh, you can do in the hardware and expose to people. You, and uh, one of the things I meant to say as I was drawing that uh, cartoon picture, um, but I didn't say, was that um, that's the way the model works. It doesn't, uh, I don't mean to imply by that that you can't actually use optimizations, or you can't speculate past things, you can't do all kinds of crazy stuff in the architecture. That's all still completely available to people. All this means is that if you do that, you have to be able to cover it up um, so you don't actually expose it. You have to be able to catch a failed speculation and all of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's still possible to do all that with RVWMO, RVTSO. Um, this is just describing what gets exposed to the programmer. OK, and uh, so this is strictly stronger than RVWMO. So this is, this is the same trade-off that um, we want to support both use cases. OK, so in terms of compatibility of different hardware and different software uh, options here, so uh, I have the table here on the right. And I want to walk through this kind of piece by piece to show what the different cases are, what the different options are. So as we said, the standard uh, RISC-V software is going to be built uh, for this uh, RVWMO memory model. That's how it's been all along. That's how it's going to continue to be. Um, because that row, at the top row here, that's the one that gives you compatibility across both RVWMO and RVTSO uh, hardware. So if you want to make sure your software is as compatible as possible, you should stick to using RVWMO. That's what the standard tool chains are going to be using. If you, want, uh, if you have hardware which is RVWMO, it's in this uh, left-hand column here. So it'll support software written for WMO. Um, it will not support software which is compiled and uh, written to assume Z, uh, TSO here. So one of the things we're going to do to make sure that we don't actually have a conflict in this box that says will not run, the big scary red text there, is that when we write TSO software, and uh, we're going to write into the binary, we'll set a flag in the header of the ELF, which will say this is compiled for TSO. It's assuming ZTSO. It won't run correctly on uh, base RVWMO hardware. And that way, we'll make sure that there's no conflict that suddenly emerges and catches people off guard. So that's this red box here. If you want compatibility, um, if you want to make sure that you can run as much software as possible on the RISC-V side, then maybe you choose to support uh, ZTSO and implement an actually uh, a core which is actually TSO. And that's a completely valid option for you. Um, it might come at the expense of performance and power area, flexibility, whatnot. That's a decision that everyone's going to have to make for themselves. Um, let's see. Another column here that's important is if you have, say, a lot of legacy x86 code that you wanted to port over uh, onto RISC-V, and you don't know, maybe, maybe it has some uh, assumptions baked in there about TSO ordering, or you don't know how to recompile it, or whatever. You just have a bunch of stuff you want it to just work. Maybe you're in this bottom row here, where you have the software that assumes TSO. And that's fine. That'll work uh, just as well. But then you have to make sure that, in that case, you run it on hardware, which implements the Z uh, TSO ISA extension. And that way, you'll be in that bottom right box there. So this is the important uh, box to keep in mind if you want to uh, consider what your options are here uh, for the two different models that we're looking at. And Again, the idea for all of this discussion is that everyone has a way to get what they want. All these use cases that I talked about, uh, that others have talked about, are going to be supported. And so the first one at the top might probably actually apply to a lot of you more than some of the stuff I said here, which is if you don't want to think about any of this, it makes your head hurt, you don't want to worry about it, you just want to keep on writing your software, that's going to work just fine. Right? We're not changing the C memory model. We're not changing Java. We're not changing any software packages. Um, people out there, uh, in conjunction with some of us in the memory model group and otherwise, uh, will write the compilers, uh, the libraries, everything else that you need to make this work. So if you want to just keep on writing your code, uh, you don't have to worry about any of this. It'll all be covered up under that uh, initial software layer. If you care about uh, performance power area, if you care about flexibility, those are the more important, use, uh, more important characteristics for you then you wanted to use, or you probably want to use RVWMO uh, to make sure you can optimize as much as possible. If you have this uh, legacy x86 code base, uh, this use case like I talked about, then you probably want hardware that implements T uh, ZTSO. Um, you may or may not want to actually remove fences that others have put in there. Um, that's another decision you might say, use ZTSO for a short term fix uh, until you can go back and port your software to use RVWMO over time. Uh, that's a decision, again, for everyone to make. We're supporting all these different use cases. Um, and then last one at the bottom here, if you actually believe TSO is the right way forward, some people do, um, that's fine also. Um, just, again, use ZTSO, use TSO hardware, and you're good to go. 
This is one point I do want to address, though. Some of you might have it in mind already, um, this risk of fragmentation with having two different memory models in conjunction um, in the same ISA. The risk would, that, would be that every software package is going to have to support an RVWMO version and an RVTSO version. It's going to make life difficult for all the maintainers and so on. And so that's a risk that we uh, acknowledge uh, going, or as a result of this compromise that we came up with to have both supported. We're, we're going in knowing that there's this risk here. Um, what we're hoping to do to mitigate it to some extent is to discourage this 2x model and really encourage software uh, to be RVWMO wherever possible, because that's the more compatible case. It'll run either way. If there's extra fences in uh, code, if you're running it on a ZTSO hardware, those fences generally just become no ops. So it's not really like it's costing you all that much to keep those in there. So really, there's a lot of motivation uh, to avoid fragmentation and just keep things RVWMO. Um, wherever possible, but at the same time, maybe uh, or at the same time, the openness of Risk Five is one of the nice features of it. That's uh, the, this isn't the only ISA extension that people can choose to implement or not implement. There's all the other different letters of the alphabet and all the Z's and X's that are coming up um, that people are going to have to choose to implement or not implement as well. So, to some extent, we're no different. Um, from the memory model perspective uh, compared to any of these other extensions as well. Uh, it's a feature, not a bug, of how RISC-V works. Uh, so that's what, we're push uh, that's what we're looking at in terms of uh, addressing this fragmentation question. Uh, so quickly, uh, just to wrap up here, uh, we did make a few other little changes. Uh, we deprecated load release and store acquire because um, they're really not what people use. It's not really as well understood as uh, the more standard load acquire and store release kinds of operations. Um, we, act, we changed what AQRL, like I said, that means RCSC and now not RCPC. Um, we clarified a bunch of other subtleties, which I'll follow up with offline. Um, there's other options that we're considering to add in the future, and not in the short term, probably in the longer term, maybe to have more flexibility in terms of what opcodes you can apply acquires and releases to, or what you can do with fences and so on. We'll follow up later with that um, in the long term. Uh, we did clarify a lot more also, or to some extent we clarified more about how I.O. works, how fence.i, sfence.vma uh, work. Um, that's all available offline. We'll work with uh, vector and transactions and JIT and whatever else comes as well as appropriate. Um, we have lots of documentation. We have a spec draft that we've been working on in the task group, which we're hoping to uh, release publicly at some point so we can get more uh, review. Uh, we have a bunch of different formal models. You can pick your preference for which one is your favorite if you have a preference. Um, people that are in the field tend to have strong preferences here. So we have all of the above. They're all compatible, so take your pick. Um, and once again, I'll wrap up with this. Come find me if you have any questions, any concerns about any of this. If you want to know if your hardware or your, soft or your software is going to be supported by all these uh, options that I'm discussing. Um, and if all goes well, we'll work with the ratification process and the, uh, everything else uh, to push this forward um, and release it to everybody so everyone can use it. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll wrap up. <laughs>